JBN, we keep you informed. I'm Michelle Jones and in the news. Illegal gun recovered in Manchester, man arrested. The police in Manchester on Tuesday arrested a man following the siege of the illegal gun and the six rounds of ammunition during an operation in Clarkstone District in Poros. The police report that about 3.10 p.m., lawmen were on duty when they saw a group of men at a garage. It is alleged that on seeing the police, one of the men took a bag from around his neck and threw it behind a plastic tank. The bag was retrieved by the police, and a search of it revealed 1.3 revolver containing 6.38 rounds of ammunition, according to the police. The man was subsequently taken into custody. Man sentenced over three years after tricking people in motor vehicle sales scam. A man was on Tuesday in the Kingston and St. Andrew Parish Court, sentenced to three years and six months imprisonment for defrauding 17 people of over $10 million in a motor vehicle sales scam. The man, Renford Suarez, was charged with obtaining money by false pretense, fraudulent conversion, absconding bail, and a larceny by trick. He pleaded guilty to the charges on February 8, 2022, after initially pleading not guilty in 2021. For the 11 counts of obtaining money by false pretense, Suarez was sentenced to two years imprisonment at hard labor. He was also sentenced to one year imprisonment at hard labor for the charge of larceny by trick, which is to run consecutively to the charge of obtaining money by false pretense. For the charge of absconding bail, he was sentenced to six months imprisonment at hard labor, which is to run consecutively with a last and by trick charge. Swords was also given another two years imprisonment at hard labor for the charge of fraudulent conversion, which is to run concurrently with the offense of obtaining money by false pretense. He was also ordered to pay restitution to the victims. The court was also made aware that Suarez had previous convictions of the same nature in excess of 50 cases. This detail is the reason the prosecution had requested the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions to transfer the matter to the Supreme Court, which has greater authority to impose a higher sentence. However, on Tuesday, the court was told that the directive from that office is to have the matter completed at the parish level. According to court documents, Suarez's modus operandi was to convince his victims that he has vehicles they can purchase, and after receiving the money, the complainants would not receive the vehicles. In one instance, between January 10 and 18, 2017, Suarez told a man that he was a customs officer of the Jamaica Customs Agency, and he offered the complainant to sell him two vehicles. The complainant reportedly paid $810,000 to Suarez, but didn't receive the vehicles. The vehicles he propositioned, the court was told, were Toyota Mark X, Nissan Eddie Wagon, Toyota Axio, and a Toyota Pro Box, ranging from the year 2012 to 2018. It was reportedly apprehended in 2021 and gave the police a fictitious name. On the charge of absconding bail, Swords was required to attend court on October 21, 2021, but did not attend. A warrant was ordered and stayed until December 3, 2021, then the warrant was ordered for his arrest on that day. His attorney at law attempted to plead for leniency on his behalf, but ended up agreeing with senior parish judge, Lauren Cole Montague, that the aggravating factors far outweigh the mitigating factors in the case. I know that this court heard from my client as it relates to restitution, and it was clearly stated in court that Mr. Suarez is not in a position to make restitution, which will be one of those aggravating factors, the attorney said, before proceeding to tell the judge that his client's fate was in her hands. Suarez has other matters that were not dealt with on Tuesday. He is set to return to court on December 14 for those cases to be mentioned. Williams insists on allowing schools to enforce own uniform rules. Minister of Education and Youth, Favel Williams, is insisting that the Education Ministry will allow school administrators to enforce rules regarding school uniforms. She reiterated that position during Wednesday morning's post-Cabinet press briefing at Jamaica House. It is not currently done, and it is not our intention to prescribe the length of a girl's uniform or the length of a boy's pants or the size of it. We leave those decisions to our boards in our schools and each school as a board comprising a parent and a student representative, William said. The policy of the ministry is an overarching one. It does not prescribe the details for our schools. The policy says to all our schools that, one, their local policy for the school should be written. It should be arrived at through a consultative process with all the stakeholders, meaning parents, um, teachers, students, and other stakeholders. 
the policy should not be discriminatory. The policy should recognize cultural differences, religious differences, and so on, but it must be applied fairly across all students. So we set at a high level um, those, uh, the standards, if you will, by which we will measure the policy at the school level. It is not currently done, and it is not our intention to prescribe the length of a girl's uniform or the length of a, a boy's pants or the size of it. We leave those decisions to our boards in our schools, and each of our school has a board uh, comprising a parent rep, a student rep, depending on if you're primary versus high school. Um, we have principal, sometimes vice principals at our schools, and we believe that those, the decisions about uniform is best done at the school level. We encourage a consultative process. Uniforms have been a staple in the Jamaican culture, in the Jamaican society, um, going back probably centuries. Uh, there is um, you know, great pride that schools take in designing their uniforms and in prescribing exactly what it should look like. I know that our schools do send out information. Man convicted of beheading lover wants a sentence quashed. A 58-year-old businessman who beheaded the mother of his child and threw a body in a septic tank in 2012 is now fighting to have his 20 years to life sentence set aside and his murder conviction quashed in the Court of Appeal. The matter started in the appellant court on Monday and will continue on Thursday with arguments from attorney at law, Oswest Sina Smith, who is representing the appellant, Trevor Taff. The decomposing body of 26-year-old Igla Nicole Aaron, with a chop wound to her face and vagina, and multiple stab wounds to her neck, was found in a tank at her lover's home a month after she was reported missing. Aaron, who at the time had a six-month-old daughter with a businessman, was last seen by her parents on April 3, 2012, heading to Taft's home in Havendale, St. Andrew. Following the discovery of her body along with the burnt remains of her clothing, a wig that she was wearing, as well as her phone and electric charger at Taft's home, he was arrested and charged with murder. The then 52-year-old father of eight was subsequently convicted of murder in July 2016 by a seven-member jury in the Home Circuit Court and sentenced by Justice Evan Brown. His conviction, however, was based purely on circumstantial evidence as there were no eyewitnesses or forensic evidence tying him to the gruesome murder. Among the evidence presented was that he had told Aaron's sister when she had called inquiring about her sister's whereabouts that she had gone to Oterius at a stage show and would return soon. The court also heard that when the sister called him after, he told her that her sister would soon pop up like peas. Another piece of evidence was that Taff had indicated that he had reported Aaron missing but checks found that he had only reported two televisions missing from his home. The investigator in the case also testified that after he started probing the missing report, he could not locate Taff at his home or workplace, even though he had spoken to Taff's lawyer twice. The investigator further testified that after Aaron's body was found, the police found Taff in a one-room building in Dwayne Park, St. Andrew, and that when he was cautioned, Taff held his hands above his head, declaring, Daniel's God, you shall deliver me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The court also heard that when the police informed him that they wanted to speak about Aaron, he started speaking in tongues and later declared that he was only praying. The businessman, however, has maintained his innocence even after his conviction, claiming he loved the mother of his child and would never hurt her. Taff, in his defense, claimed he left Aaron at his home on April 5 in the company of his nephew and a worker. On his return the following day, he said he did not see any of them but discovered his televisions missing. Senior Smith said among the grounds of appeal are that the trial judge ought to have upheld the no-case submission and that the judge failed to deliver a balanced assessment of the case for the prosecution and defense. The judge's summing up was weighed more towards the prosecution than the defense. The judge did not achieve a balance and there were bits of evidence that were allowed that prejudiced the appellant, he said. Senior Smith also argued that the judge had failed to give the jury direction about the prejudice arising from the content of the question and answer session which his client had participated in. Two American women face court on drug trafficking charges. 
Two New Yorkers were hauled before the Kingston and St. Andrew Parish Court on Tuesday to answer to drug trafficking charges after packages of cocaine were found strapped to their thighs and calves at the Norman Man International Airport. The woman, Shamika Roberts, a dancer, and Rhonda Shaw, a teacher and caregiver, were charged with possession of cocaine, dealing in cocaine, attempting to export cocaine, and conspiracy to export cocaine on September 21. The woman was snapped with the charges following a question and answer session in the presence of their attorney, Aisha Rob Cunningham, at the Narcotics Division headquarters in downtown Kingston. Roberts and Shaw pleaded not guilty to the charges. The allegations are that the woman were apprehended on Thursday, September 15, at the airport when police officers from the Narcotics Division noticed irregularities during security checks. After searching the woman, it was discovered that they had four packages of cocaine strapped to their thighs and calves. The packages found on Roberts, according to court documents, weighed 3 pounds and 13 ounces, and for Shaw, the packages weighed 4 pounds and 6.5 ounces. Hearing that Rob Cunningham intended to apply for a bail for a client, the prosecution opposed bail, arguing that they are foreigners and should remain in jail until the matter is dealt with. However, the attorney challenged this position. She argued that the women have connections in the island they can stay with. Rob Cunningham also said that there are precedents where accused people who lived in another country were offered bail, but a date for a bail application was not decided on. Additionally, Senior Parish Judge Lauren Cole Montague was informed that the investigating officer requested access to Roberts and Shaw's phone, but it was denied. The investigating officer submitted an application pursuant to provisions of the Cyber Crimes Act, which the judge signed, allowing them to legally search the devices. The women are to return to court on October 28. Health Ministry to discontinue daily COVID-19 updates. The Ministry of Health and Wellness is reporting that it is to stop issuing daily COVID-19 updates and will start doing so once a week. The change is to take effect on Saturday, October 1. No explanation was given for the move. The Health Ministry says COVID-19 numbers will not be published in its surveillance bulletin, which is put out weekly on the Ministry's website at moh.gov.jm. Jamaica recorded its first COVID-19 case in March 2020, and since then, over 150,000 infections have been confirmed, and the death tally now stands at over 3,300. Jamaica reports 39 new COVID-19 cases, two deaths. The Ministry of Health and Wellness reported 39 new COVID-19 cases and two deaths on Tuesday, September 27, bringing the infection total to 151,791. The new cases comprise 14 females and 25 males, with ages ranging from 3 years to 100 years. The cases were recorded in Kingston and St. Andrew, 17, Clarendon, 5, Westmoreland, 5, St. Catherine, 4, Manchester, 2, St. Anne, 2, St. James, 2, and Trelawney, 2. Two deaths were recorded for the period. These were an 88-year-old male and an 8-year-old male from Kingston and St. Andrew. There were 83 recoveries in the last 24 hours, bringing the total to 99,125, the minister said. Currently, 64 people are hospitalized, 18 of whom are moderately ill, 2 severely ill, and 1 in critical condition. Jamaica's positivity rate for the latest round of testing is 8.6%. In sports news, Tala was too hot for the Kings. The Jamaican Tala was on the backs of their spinners booked their place in qualifier 2 of the Caribbean Premier League following a 33-run win over St. Lucia Kings in their eliminator encounter at the Providence Stadium in Guyana. After clawing their way to 148-48 in their allotted 20 overs, the Tallows were able to staff the Kings batting and restricted them to 115 all-out in 18 overs. That restriction was led by the Tallows spin trio of Mohamed Nabi, Ahmad Wasim and Fabian Allen, who took eight wickets between them to blow through the Kings lineup. After sending the Tallows into bat, the Kings may have felt that their decision was justified having the Jamaican franchise in a tizzy at 115-48 in the 18th over. The Tallowers knew that wickets were their only hope to restrict the powerful Kings batting lineup and they got the good start when Mohamed Amir knocked over the tournament's leading run scorer Jason Charles for just three with only 10 runs on the board. Captain Rovman Paul was overjoyed at the way his troops defended a respectable score on the lights at Providence. It's a very important night. A lot of credit must be given to the boys. The way Honambi finished innings was fantastic, and the way the guys stuck in was tremendous. 
The Tallows are now facing the Guyana Amazon Warriors in qualifier 2 for a place in the final. JBN, we keep you informed. Please remember to subscribe, like, share, leave us a comment and click the notification bell to receive our daily news items.